I think people need to ask themselves, why do we do these physical fitness assessments in the first place? What is their purpose? Welcome back to the Clinical Athlete Podcast. If you're not familiar with Clinical Athlete, we're a network of healthcare providers, students, and coaches who specialize in the management of athletes. You can find your nearest Clinical Athlete provider at clinicalathlete.com. We also have the Clinical Athlete Forum, where we discuss and share ideas and resources related to athlete health and performance. To join the forum or for potential listing on the Clinical Athlete Directory and for all upcoming seminars, webinars, and events, details can be found on the website. This podcast can also be found on your favorite podcast platform, and if that platform allows you to rate the show, we'd appreciate you taking the time to do that so that we can get this information out to as many people as possible. My name is Quinn Hennick. I'm a doctor of physical therapy in Orange County, California at Clinical Athlete Newport. On this show, we are joined by co-host Jared Maynard, who is the Clinical Athlete Continuing Education Director and a physiotherapist at Depth Physiotherapy in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. He is also a strength coach and a competitive powerlifter himself. And we have our other co-host, John Flagg, who is an athletic trainer and the powerlifting, weightlifting, and strongman coach at 301 Strong in White Plains, Maryland, and the owner of Rebuild Stronger an online coaching platform for strength athletes. He is also a clinical athlete provider and lead instructor of the Clinical Athlete Powerlifting Certification. We are also very excited to welcome onto the show Dr. James Nuzo, who holds a PhD from the University of New South Wales and is a former postdoctoral fellow at Neuroscience Research Australia. He recently authored a paper titled The Case for Retiring Flexibility as a Major Component of Physical Fitness. And that's what we're going to be talking about on this show. We hope you enjoy it. Dr. Nuzo, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. And I know that you prefer to be called Jim, so from this point forward, we will refer to you as Jim. But we wanted to get you on because you recently authored a paper that is titled The Case for Retiring Flexibility as a Major Component of Physical Fitness. And this always seems that the the concept of flexibility or that construct and then stretching as kind of an intervention, at least for our field in sports rehab and sports performance, it, it seems to be kind of a never-ending conversation. Uh, and this paper, I think, it was really, really awesome at, at asking some really good questions and getting us thinking about the topic, and it was a no-brainer for us to ask you on. So uh, we're going to dig into that paper, but before we do that, can you tell our uh, six listeners a little bit more about yourself? We might have seven, but usually if somebody says that we have seven, it means one dropped off. So we're pretty comfortable saying we have about six listeners at this point. But what's led to your current research tracks, your current interest in the field, maybe even getting into the, some of the impetus of writing this paper? Uh, just tell our, tell our listeners a little bit more about you. All right, so my background is in exercise science. So I've got bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in exercise science. Um, and those are from universities in the U.S., Slippery Rock University for bachelor's and Appalachian State for master's. Um, in my master's, that was starting to focus more in on strength and conditioning sorts of uh, research because I do have background as a um, competitive power lifter. It was not a very long uh, career, but um, but I do have a background in that and more strength power sports anyways, American football and that sort of thing. Um, I eventually moved to Australia to do a PhD um, at the University of New South Wales in Sydney in conjunction uh, with Neuroscience Research Australia. And what I looked at for my PhD was neural adaptations to strength training. And then um, after that, I worked as a postdoc at Neura. And in addition to studying the things I was paid to study, I've started to do some side projects. 
And this flexibility paper was one of those. And I'll give you the story on how it all started, if that's all right. Please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. So what actually happened was I had no intentions of writing this paper. Um, I, I really, my interest in flexibility is not as really passionate as I think a lot of people. It's like, especially stretch gurus and those types. But what happened was um, I was working on a paper, which is now published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. Um, it's a it's a corp review paper. So this is a series of publications that the Journal of Applied Physiology is putting out to improve reproducibility of results in science. And we were asked, uh, myself along with Simon Gandivia and Janet Taylor, who are world experts in measuring things like muscle fatigue, muscle strength, we were asked to write this review paper for the journal. Um, in doing that, we were talking about things like reproducibility of strength measurements, how to make them uh, most accurate. And in building the case for just sort of introducing the concept of muscle strength, I was looking at the literature that correlates muscle strength with mortality rates and all the rest of it. When I got into that literature, there was this one paper published in 2002 in Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. It found, like every other paper, that muscle strength correlates with mortality rates. But what was interesting is that it had the fit and reach test in there as well, and it didn't cor correlate with mortality. And I think that's interesting because a lot of things correlate with mortality rates. Like it's not it, a, a lot of these measurements of uh, fitness and performance, they'll usually correlate with mortality in some way. Like, um, so I just found it very strange that that didn't work out. So that led me to do a little bit more on just looking at mortality. And I could find one other paper that looked at it and it didn't correlate with mortality rates either. And then that just led to this spiral of me sort of getting interested in flexibility. And actually, is it all that important? Because I don't know about you guys, but I've heard people along the way complain about, oh, you know, I can't reach down and touch my toes, but I can do this perfectly well, or I can do this fine. And so there's been mumblings over the years about flexibility. But um, yeah, that was the initial step. And then I just got all in. I said, I'm all in. I'm going to look at it. And the more I got all in, the more I convinced uh, convince myself that what I was doing was important and people needed to, to hear it. Well, we hear in the clinic, the narrative on, on flexibility is still very much alive. And obviously, we'll get into the, some of the nitty gritty on defining terms and being a little bit more nuanced with contextual factors and what we are actually talking about when we, when we discuss flexibility and stretching and these types of things. But the uh, one one thing that I loved about your paper was the horse the historical background that you provided all the way from the beginning. Uh, I mean, the sit and reach test is is seventy years old, but the the notion of flexibility potentially being important in health and fitness even dated back beyond that. And and you give a really really nice background to that, and, and it's just interesting to see how it evolved, not necessarily from evidence, but from just narrative and uh, popular opinion, it seemed to be at least. But with with that, the aim, so in section three of the paper, you, you lay it out pretty plainly. And it's it says, the current paper provo proposes flexibility be retired as a major component of physical fitness. Can you, can we kind of start at the beginning here and maybe trace trace back the construct of flexibility when it started to become on the radar for health organizations and why it started to be uh, thought of as a major component of physical fitness. And then maybe we can dig into why it's not necessarily. Yeah. Well, to just very quickly answer your question, why it was thought of as a major component, I don't know, because as I lay out in the paper, the evidence was never really all that strong. So, where I start in the paper is with um, Curtin's, I think it's 1941 paper published in Research Quarterly. So Research Quarterly is a very important journal um, in the history of exercise science and physical education and even physical therapy. And this is where a lot of, a, a lot of papers that have influenced exercise science 
sort of started from. This was before medicine and science and sports and exercise, before the ACSM existed and so on. Um, and Curtin's paper, what he was looking at was, it was sort of a review mixed in with some original data that he collected um, on swimmers and then some control participants. And I think what he demonstrated there was that the swimmers had higher levels of flexibility than the controls, which is not unusual. That's a fairly normal uh, finding from what I see. But what's so interesting about that paper, and I pointed that out in my paper, is that when he went to correlate swim performance with the flexibility, not only did it not correlate, he didn't even bother to report the correlation because he basically said, oh, there's there's no significant correlation. Yet, things just somehow evolved over time and people still just couldn't, I sort of guess, escape the fact that maybe it's not all that important, especially, and this is really important with my paper is the broader perspective and context, is um, in relation to all the other components of fitness. Um, so that's, that paper by Curtin is the main one that got it going, really, at least as far as my historical uh, understanding. And then over the time, the 50s and the 60s, you continue to have similar sorts of papers like cross-sectional studies looking at, you know, sex differences in flexibility, maybe age differences and so on and so forth. And you just find some of these commentary sort of style pieces that just sort of say how important it is, but yet they'd actually, if you look at the pieces closely, there's not strong evidence there. Um, there was one interesting paper. Uh, which one was that? Holland in 1968 was one person who finally said something. Oh, actually, the correlation probably is not as strong as we believe. That, that was a, a really good review paper that I found, but it didn't stop the momentum. Uh, so I think in 1980, that's when school fitness, well, I got to take a step back. So in the 1950s is when we got in the U.S. Um, the president's um, group on physical fitness. Dwight Eisenhower was uh, the president at the time. And the whole reason for that, by the way, which is an, another interesting historical fact, which is that the whole reason in the U.S. that we have this President's Council on Physical Fitness and we do school-based fitness testing is that in the 50s, there was a study published in the journal Research Quarterly that showed that American uh, school students had lower levels of physical fitness than European students. And that included a test of flexibility, among many others. So that, it just goes to show you how important and influential certain research papers can be. It was the cause of what we do. Now, I'm, I'm American, so I went through all those school-based fitness tests. Um, and that paper is the reason why. Um, then it's sort of in 1980s, it started to pick up. The fit reach was included in um, the manual for physical fitness testing, and it's been a part of it. Um, ever since, and I believe it, it still is. So just to anchor the conversation a little bit, we define, and you define flexibility in the paper with a couple references, is referring to the intrinsic properties of body tissues that determine maximal joint range of motion without causing injury. And then, with so with that, it's, it's a pretty, it can be a pretty nonspecific term, flexibility. So there's probably a lot of things that encompass the range of motion that is expressed and you dig into that a little bit and, and you differentiate between dynamic flexibility, which is kind of our volitional motor drive of doing, doing some type of movement pattern or the dictated by the muscle tendon stiffness and, and some of the properties therein. But the paper we're dealing more here with static flexibility or what we would think of as traditionally where we're not volitionally contracting the muscle and we're just looking to go to whatever that end range is. And you make an interesting point that it, that is subjective. Flexibility is, a static flexibility is, is a subjective measure in a, in a sense because you're really going to the tolerance of the person rather mm -hmm. than to their f true physiological 
end range, as in if we could do like a thought experiment and you stretch to your perceived end range and then I snapped a finger and all of a sudden you were asleep or under anesthesia, you would hypothetically be able to go further. Then some type of, of feedback loop there would be switched off and then uh, you'd be able to passively stretch those tissues further. And then I wanted to anchor as well, as we talk about the paper, a lot of the, the narrative was based on the sit and reach test. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Do you want me to explain why that, why that is? Yeah, I think so. Cause then I, later on, I'm going to ask, well, how, what can we, can we extrapolate, you know, basically t- to flexibility as a whole, we're talking about other joints in the body, but yeah, let's, let's start there. Yeah. So that's, I've, I've seen on Twitter, that's been sort of a bit of a criticism of it. And I try to address it early on, but the whole reason for it is because the sit and reach test is the test recommended by the ACSM for health-based um, fitness testing. It's the one that's included in school-based fitness tests in the U.S. And that's it. I mean, that is the, the simple reason why. And there's, you know, lots of, a, a lot of research uses the sit and reach when it, for whatever purpose it's measuring flexibility, like if it wants to correlate it with activities of daily living or whatever it is, the sit and reach test is, I think, probably the most well-known and it's continually used in research and in practice in terms of the fitness testing domain. So um, that's that's the main reason. And yeah, I think it's good to be upfront about that, that it focuses, it's not exclusively about the sit and reach, but m- the majority of the paper is referencing papers that use the SimReach test. Well, I also think it's important because I want to really get into one of the points I think that you've made really clear is flexibility is seems to be task specific and you don't necessarily get more gold stars if you have more flexibility than the task requires. And there might be other ways to train that provide you with the same benefit of increased range of motion other than static stretching that also provides you other physiological benefits. It seemed to be the crux of it, and that's what really pulled on my heartstrings. But if we pull back from there for a second, I want to dig into the injury risk because we're, John Jared and I are clinicians. And a large body of our, uh, of our listeners are clinicians as well, student clinicians. And it's still taught. I mean, I'm, we're not that far removed from school. And you know, flexibility was still a, a trait that was taught in school. We still test for it, passive testing. Uh, we, you know, we got our goniometers in our back pocket, these types of things. And, and we're thinking about not only providing them with more range of motion to be quote unquote functional, to be able to do what they want to do, but also to decrease the risk of injury with static stretching, with providing them intervention to become more flexible. When you were doing some of your literature review and you were digging into the relationship with flexibility and injury risk, what were you seeing? What was, what was the theme there? Uh, I, I would say the theme is that the evidence is not as strong as the common perception, particularly of, I think, the general population, but I think even amongst maybe clinicians who as well who don't maybe read as much research. Um, to be honest with you, it's actually the least interesting part of the paper for me. I was interested in more of the other stuff because I'm not um, a physical therapist, so I don't deal a lot with injuries and that sort of thing, but... Um, yeah, it's just, uh, and, and in the paper, I, I made, um, the best effort I could to reference Cochrane reviews, which are uh, sort of viewed as a, as a very high standard of evidence where they consider, you know, all possible studies done on the topic and they, um, evaluate the quality of the evidence as well. Cause sometimes you can get a study that shows that, uh, you know, stretching or flexibility level do or do not correlate with injury. But then if you actually look at the quality of the study, it could be very poor or it could be very high. 
So Kafka reviews um, tend to take that um, into consideration. But um, overall, there's just not a lot of strong evidence, particularly with the sit and reach test, that it correlates with injuries. And I referenced a couple of studies done in uh, military uh, populations where in one of the studies, and so that what they would have done is they would have measured the sit and reach scores at baseline. And then um, I think this is in military cadets, maybe going through basic training, or they follow them up for a couple of years and look to see who and who, who does and who doesn't get an injury. Um, and I can't remember exactly which injuries they were looking at, and that's all very important as well, but that'll be in the paper. Um, and what they found actually is that the people with the cadets with the highest sit reach scores were actually the ones more likely to, to get injured. Uh, there was a follow-up study, slightly different, but again in a male military population, and what then that one found was that all oh, was actually both the highest and the lowest Reach scores that were that were more likely to predict injury. So there's that one. But what's interesting is that in females in the military, it wasn't predictive of injuries um, in any way. And that's actually important because females are more likely to get injured in military training, like by far. Um, and I cite that evidence as well. So um, yeah, I guess overall the evidence is just not that impressive, particularly when you consider how strong the narrative is. There was two things that spoke to me as I was reading through, and I kind of agree with you in that that section is not as exciting because it's just pretty much there's nothing to draw from it. I mean, what, again, your it, your paper was so great at providing uh, the historical background of these things. I mean, there's 300 references. I'm going to be... I'm going to be pulling up your paper all the time just to cross-reference. And, but, mm-hmm. but these studies, it just shows you the complexity of trying to identify risk factors for future injury when you have conclusions that are either contradictory or e- equivocal between groups where it's not, it, it's not providing you any, any uh, nudge one way or another, or it's correlational data where you You don't know which way that that directional arrow is pointing. And it's just a tough conversation to have. The other piece of it to me is, well, let's think about injuries that happen, especially in a sporting population or, you know, in the military. There's tissues being subjected to high forces. And many times tissues being subjected to high forces at a high rate is then being statically flexible the same type of trait because we talk about injury we're we're trying to prepare the body so we can call we can simplify injury by saying oh the the forces were beyond the tissue's capacity to to cope whatever that means but is reaching and touching your toes in a very controlled slow manner allowing the tissue to just kind of accommodate the stretch is that the same as sprinting and straining your hamstring under high loads done at very, very short time uh, impulses or apocs. So it just says when we think about the plausibility of it, you know, the physiological plausibility, that's also where I get hung up from an, from an injury risk standpoint. I agree with you. I'd say section five was probably my favorite. And that's where we we get into making a case for de-emphasizing stretching in regards to exercise prescription. So if we're we're talking about flexibility, you know, you you set the stage of flexibility as as a test, as an assessment, as, as a quality to test for, well, then there must be an intervention for it. And that would be then static stretching. But you make a great case that static stretching is not the only thing that provides the benefits that static static stretching provides. Can you go into that a little bit and maybe the case for some other types of training modalities? Yeah. So I guess to sort of just even take a further step back, I think people need to ask themselves, why do we do these physical fitness assessments in the first place? What is their purpose? And once you understand what the purpose 
is. So in my in my mind, it's to gain information about the individual to then guide their exercise prescription. At least that's sort of to me the main purpose um, to identify potential weaknesses that can be improved. So that's how I sort of have made the transition in the paper from, oh, well, actually, if flexibility as a fitness component isn't correlating with a whole lot, then we need to take a look at stretching, which, so for the ACSM, for example, um, the main purpose for including stretching in a program is to improve flexibility. It doesn't really, maybe it says something about injury risk, but I've, as I've shown, that's um, not really a valid claim. So if flexibility is not all that important, then maybe we don't need to have stretching. So um, that's that's the whole link there. Uh, it's possible stretching could be doing other things that might be important other than improving flexibility. But I, as I point out in the paper, like that needs to be examined. And then organizations need to change their sort of uh, narrative around it to say, oh, look, it's not just improve flexibility. It would be to do this, 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 and this. But that's not being done right now. The main purpose of stretching is to improve flexibility. Um, and what was the next part that uh, I was supposed to get into here? Um, oh, yeah, so other modalities. So, yeah, that's the whole thing um, is that it's almost like we're hung up on this idea that static stretching is the only time that muscles and tendons are lengthened or the only prescription you can provide someone. Um, and that's just not true. Our muscles and tendons and, uh, are lengthened uh, when we do everything, uh, when we, you know, walk and squat. And so in, in the paper, because I've got a background in resistance training and measuring muscle, muscle strength. And again, this was not something I knew prior to getting into this paper, but resistance training, again, this assumes you're having your clients go through full range of motion, which is what you're supposed to do with resistance training. Um, when they do that, they can, for example, improve uh, their sit and reach scores. So I make the case that, look, even if you are interested in improving flexibility, even though I've demonstrated it's actually probably not all that important, but let's say you're still hung up on it and you still think, oh, there's got to be something there. Well, that doesn't necessitate stretching as a prescription. I think in the paper I report, I don't know, 10 studies that have shown uh, resistance training improves sit and reach scores by somewhere between 10 and 25%. It's not as good uh, an improvement in sit and reach scores compared to like static stretching alone, but, you know, who cares? I've just I've just sort of explained that flexibility is not all that important anyway. So it, it's just sort of a compromise, I guess, to say, look, I'm trying to be a bit humble here. Maybe there's some things we don't quite understand about flexibility that make it more important than I'm realizing. But even if it is, you don't have to do stretching to improve it. Well, I, I think you do a great job of being humble and getting that point across. And in addition to section five being a great section, I really love section seven, where you make it very clear what you're not saying. You know, you're not saying that no one should ever stretch ever. Um, the main argument is that this should be maybe revised as one of the main components of physical fitness um, and maybe move to maybe a secondary thing. And going back to what Quinn said, <clears throat> the flexibility that someone needs to have to perform a particular thing or engage in a particular sport, that's task specific. So if someone doesn't have the flexibility to, I don't know, uh, have a really nice, efficient freestyle stroke as a swimmer, maybe they could engage in some sort of thing to improve that. But then again, like you've just gotten finished saying, it doesn't necessarily have to be stretching uh, to accomplish that end. If the person enjoys it, sure. Um, but I think also going back to what you said about the narrative, the strong narratives attached to this, um, as clinicians and researchers, we, you know, not that we're researchers, but you are obviously, we've got influence over how people think they need to spend their time. And given that we can't manufacture any more time than we currently have, I think it's important that we tend to lead people in the direction that allows them to maximize the use of their time to the end of performing what they want to do as well as they might do that thing. 
Yeah, so th- that's something I... See, when I write this paper as sort of a general exercise scientist, I guess is how I think of myself, um, I have in mind more of the general population, which in the U.S., for example, we know we've got some issues with overweight and obesity. And I'm thinking, you know, if you have, if an individual can dedicate, let's say, 30 minutes three times a week for a, for gym sessions or whatever the case may be, to me, that's a very inefficient use of time to take, let's say, five to 10 minutes of that 30 minutes and use it for static stretching. Because the, um, I don't want to say the only benefit of stretching, the only well-documented benefit of stretching is improved flexibility, right? You might get some other stuff out of it, but what I put in the paper is, look, you can actually improve flexibility with exercise modalities that simultaneously cause more robust health improvements. So improvements in cardiovascular health, improvements in muscle strength. So that sort of individual, that general overweight person who needs to start exercising, um, I think we just need to be very honest and say the person needs to get moving and do stuff. And stretching is a very passive, when we're talking about static stretching, it's a very passive activity. And I'm not saying it doesn't have other sorts of benefits, but in the, my, my paper is all about looking at the big picture. And for those sorts of individuals, I just think it's a huge waste of time. It's, it's, you know, if you take five to 10 minutes out of a 30 minute session, whatever it is. Um, now at the same time, again, this is where I try to be a bit more humble. Maybe that static stretching is that person's favorite part of the whole thing they do in that 30 minutes. And if that stretching is what leads them to do the other 20 minutes, of cardiovascular work, then fair enough that's where you got to just deal with people at an individual uh, level. But as far as recommendations go, um, and I think actually over the years, anyways, the stretching recommendations I think have started to sort of decline as the evidence really hasn't piled in like people thought. So I think we're sort of maybe been getting there anyways, but um, I don't know, maybe my paper will speed up the process. I like the point that you make there regarding the personal preference because that's one of the rebuttals that that you'll hear. Um, what if they just like it? And that's fine. I mean, what, people ask me all the time, well, what about, uh, you know, what about stretching? And the first thing that I say is, do you like it? And if they say, not really, then I say, great, because you probably don't need to do it, we can actually get those same benefits. It's exactly what you, what you laid out in your paper. If they say, yeah, I actually do, it feels nice, it helps to relax me, let's say after a workout or even as, a, as like a nighttime wind down routine. You know, they do, their, yeah. they do their kind of stretch routine on the ground, it helps them get into the, that sleep mode. And I say, that's, that's totally fine. We, we educate on what it's providing. Maybe more importantly, you educate on what it's probably not providing. So don't prioritize that over this stuff. So this stuff has to take priority to move the needle to wherever we're trying to go, that those other things can fill in the gaps if you like it. But just be more, the goal is being more realistic about what it's doing and what it's not doing. Um, and like Jared said, you, you, uh, I hope people read the full paper because uh, it's, it's part of the last part, but it's part of what you say that you're not saying is that nobody should stretch or that stretching doesn't do anything. It's just having a yep. more realistic conversation. That's right. So, um, and in one of, I sort of always, when I'm writing stuff, try to reflect back on my personal experiences. And I, I used to do a ton of stretching when I was in high school and playing sports, but mostly because that's what I was sort of, instructed to do at the time, but let me give you an example of how, and it relates to the relaxation component. So um, those people who are really sort of against stretching, um, one thing they might say is, you know, never static stretch before a football game, for example. And I'm, I think I'm pretty okay with that. But when I was played high school football, we used to, um, as a team, go out on the field course beforehand. 
we did some of the dynamic movements and, of course, our football-specific movements. But we also did a period of where we were doing your typical sort of team static stretching, right, where you partner off with someone. And it's possible that doing all that stretching may have decreased our performance. Probably not. But what was happening in that time was basically a form of meditation. So I was partnered off with one of my best friends in high school who he and I both were starters. So we would have to communicate with each other. And during that period, you're hearing the music going, right? The crowd's filing into the stadium. You're talking with each other about game planning and that sort of stuff. So this is where I try to just, I, I hope pe- you know, people don't get too confused. It's like, look, there can be other things that are happening while you're stretching that could, I don't know, help, maybe help your performance. I, I, I don't know, but in this case of sort of the relaxation and maybe sort of the, the Pilates and yoga realm as well. I think that's probably a lot of maybe what's um, happening there. I think we just sort of need to pin down, like for example, the ACSM is not recommending um, stretching because it is a form of relaxation and good for your mental health or something. They're they're recommending it because it improves flexibility. So, what we need to do is sort of um, refine our knowledge and understand maybe for those people that it, they're saying it's really good for them. Okay. Well, why is it good for you? And then what actually are the potential negative consequences? Like what might you be giving up as a result of doing that and not doing, um, you know, high load resistance training. Well, that comes back to talking about what kind of context goes around this highly specific uh, activity. When we look at stretching, it's just a very specific thing. Its effect is to increase flexibility. However, just I love the the football example because I remember the same thing, right? There's like a power of ritual there where you're connecting with another teammate and you've got communication and you've got a social aspect that's involved there. So there's a lot of context that comes into an enhancement of the actual activity beyond its own specificity. I mean, you could say the same thing for something like strength training, strength training on your own is great. You'll get the benefit out of it that you'll see from specific uh, strength training, but a community environment around a supportive team tends to see people get stronger. Now this is all anecdotal type stuff, but when you're in that team environment, there's contextual factors that help uh, kind of enhance what's actually happening. So uh, I understand that completely. And I, I think something that's important to highlight here is we're talking about a highly specific task. And when we compare it to things like strength training or full range of motion movement, we're talking about another specific task that also has tertiary benefits like increased flexibility. Uh, Mm. And that's when we start talking about task dependency. You guys mentioned a sit and reach test. I can't, for the life of me, bring my arms very far behind my back. Is that probably an adaptation to my bench press? More than likely, because when my bench was lower, I have had better shoulder flexibility than that. Um, so you have to take that into account when you start addressing this with people, especially in a clinical setting, instead of saying, oh, I, mean, I think that's the one thing that we run into a lot is telling someone they're unhealthy or dysfunctional because they lack a range of motion that, in all honesty, may be arbitrary. Yeah, so if I could add a couple of points there. Please. Um, a histo- historical um, perspective. So one of the reasons for Curtin's paper in 1941 and some of the early work on flexibility was they were concerned about what they called, quote, muscle boundness, which is what you're describing. Lifters, bodybuilders getting so muscular that they can't move. So that was actually one of the main uh, drivers for looking into flexibility. And yeah, I mean, that's, um, and look, I'm, I'm this, uh, same way, although I'm not, um, sort of as big as I used to be, but I, I can't for the life of me, uh, do the back scratch test very well. And I think that's a test that, you know, needs to be reevaluated. You know, what is the significance of reaching around your back to, you know, 
when when do you do that? I mean, I know, I know it's sort of meant to be a general measure of shoulder flexibility, but um, I, that partic- particular test, I didn't really even bother to look into it because I just think it's a, a, a bit silly. Hey guys, Quinn Hennick here. In light of our conversation with Dr. Nuzo about stretching, I wanted to take this opportunity to give you exclusive knowledge of our new product, the Stretch Band 5000. With this new innovative technology, you will be able to achieve the flexibility that you've always dreamed of. You can pre-order your Stretch Band 5000 by making a deposit of $1,000 to my Venmo. (laughs) All right. Just kidding. In all seriousness, we do hope you're enjoying the awesome discussion with Dr. Nuzo. And for real, for real, just in case you hadn't heard, Clinical Athlete is teaming up with the Level Up Initiative and putting together the first ever Kowloo Summit on September 19th, 2020 in Boston, Massachusetts. We decided to come together on this because let's face it, Clinical practice is hard, and conflicting information can leave you feeling lost. With the endless amount of research and dogmas, clinicians may feel frustrated and confused about how to help their patients. The Kalu Summit is your solution to help you gain the confidence and clarity with key rehab principles, including exercise prescription, pain science, and communication. We're centering these concepts around three common clinical cases that you may encounter, ACL reconstruction, low back pain, and tendinopathy. Gain confidence in your clinical practice and find your path to success and hang out with a bunch of badass providers from our communities. For more information on the summit, head over to kalusummit.com. That's C-A-L-U summit.com. You can also find the link in the show notes. Hope to see you there. And now back to the show. I just want to jump in about adaptations. And, you know, I agree. I think we hear these narratives come up often enough where a clinician might, might be assessing someone or even a coach for that matter. Um, and find that someone can't perform a particular movement or test to whatever those standards are and say, oh, well, you know, we're at higher risk of injury or you got to you got to change that. Otherwise, we're in a bad situation. But if we were to look at a major league baseball pitcher, you know, their their throwing arm almost certainly is more stiff than their non throwing arm. Um, and is that a bad thing? No, it's it's adaptive more than likely. It's probably why they can play in the big league. Um, or same thing with, um, I don't know the technical name, but rowers who have got an oar on one side, they're probably going to have some sort of imbalance or difference in terms of their flexibility on one side versus the other. And do we need to alter that? Probably not, because it's helping them in their, their given sport. So I think that, again, as always, context ends up being an important thing to discuss, and we have a hard time making accurate blanket statements um, Yeah, about this sort of thing. Yeah, so if I can j- jump in on specificity really quickly. Yeah. Um, the thing to keep in mind, again, with all this is, so flexibility, like the sit and reach test, it's really a surrogate measure. It's not actually the performance itself that you're interested in. It's the same thing when you measure, um, uh, well, unless you're a competitive powerlifter, your 1RM. Your one, a 1RM is a for, again, non-powerlifters, is a surrogate measure of performance or a a vertical jump, for example, the vertical jump test. No athlete, for example, is performing the exact vertical jump test in their game. So it's a surrogate measure of performance. So the reason I bring that up is this notion of specificity. So, for example, if in a research study, um, and let's say it's an elderly individual, you want to see what fitness measures correlate with um, activities of daily living or, or some other measure that's a bit closer to being an actual like activity of daily living. So maybe an up and go test or, or something like that. If you think that up and go test is so important to look for a correlation with flexibility between it, then why not just prescribe to people up and go tests? Or, you know, if that's what you think is so important, why why bother trying to indirectly increase that test or that performance by improving flexibility? Why don't you just practice the test? So this is something that's coming up in the strength literature right now um, as well, where we're getting a bit hung up on what is muscle strength? How do you measure it to sort of be most reflective of um, 
performance. Uh, there's a lot of this now with sort of measuring vertical jump height as well. Like, you know, why? You know, can we get me better measures of actually, um, in terms of athletes, like in-game performance rather than these surrogate measures? And again, I think that's another thing to keep in mind with flexibility and the sit and reach. It's not actually your daily performance. Well, I would make a point that I was that I'll forget about, but just to uh, just to defend maybe some of our uh, female listeners, the only time that in the clinic where it's been relevant reaching behind your back is for some of my female patients who have shoulder injuries and and mm -hmm. yep. you know donning and doffing certain garments. But I just it, it popped into my head because in case there's some female listeners that say, "Hey, I have to reach behind my back," I say, "Okay," uh, but <laughs> but it, there's not a lot. Uh, you know, aside from that, there's not a whole lot where you're where you're doing something like an aptly scratch test. But we talk about specificity and looking in the paper in section four point eight, you actually list a bunch of references and some some interesting findings there uh, per sport, where, for example, swimmers exhibit greater hamstring flexibility and, and ankle plantar flexion. Uh, shoulder flexion, trunk extension makes perfect sense, right? Based on their task. Dancers have more hamstring flexibility, hip external rotation, abduction, ankle plantar flexion makes perfect sense with what they do. Uh, weightlifters have more shoulder flexion than bodybuilders and powerlifters, and powerlifters and bodybuilders actually have less shoulder flexion than the general population. So then we, we go back kind of full circle to what John was talking about. Yeah. And you know, what if... But if John comes into the clinic and says, hey, my performance is really high in powerlifting, but I can't do my, like to say his job is some type of manual thing where he has to use his shoulders. He's like, I can't get into positions. I say, okay, well, do you want to, but his goals are maintain maximal performance in powerlifting, also be able to do my tasks. And say, there might have to be some give and take there. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking at these sports, the other piece of it is, what if you just do the sport, will you then adapt to these types of things? If you're looking for more range of motion to be able to do the thing, what if you just do the thing and we're assuming that the, the training is appropriately dosed, the variations are such that they're modified in ways that if you can't do the, spe the very specific task of the goal, they're layered so that you can do somewhat of a variation that, that resembles that, and then you develop this, this specific flexibility over time. And if you're, if you're just one of those people who genetically, you don't quite have the trait, you're probably going to get trimmed out of that pool anyway. Like as much as John wants to be a world-class gymnast, he's too big. And... <laughs> and it's, Why you got to crush my dreams, yeah. man? <laughs> <laughs> or like, you know, with me, my bias, all of this stuff is speaking to my bias, mostly because I've always hated static stretching. Since I can remember since kindergarten. It was, I hated it. It was the worst part of gym class. You're reaching forward to touch my toes. Like I get that neural tension back there. I just absolutely hate it. And I just never had a lot of excursion. I have more now, but I've also been competing in the sport of, of weightlifting for t 10 years, which necessitates ranges of motion that are more extreme. And I, my flexibility has gotten a hell of a lot better without static stretching, just doing that type of training. But, you know, I, I just, I just think that maybe some people are wired up for certain things and the sport almost chooses them more so than they, they train their body into the sport, or at least it works somewhat in both directions. Um, I don't know. The sport specificity piece of it is, is always interesting to me. It's like, which way does the arrow go? Well, yeah, just quickly, I'll just throw in there. I know, I know it's cross-sectional data, for example, on swimmers versus controls or dancers versus controls, but it just actually speaks to the notion of, so I, I do think, I agree with you, there will be some, um, you know, different people have different biological propensities that make them sort of go in those directions, but um, it sort of speaks to the notion that you don't have to do static stretching per se to improve flexibility. It's likely someone could get involved in a swimming program or a dancing class or a, um, a gymnastics and by practicing those movements, they would 
improve their flexibility without actually doing prescribed static um, stretching. So that actually sort of relates a bit to the later part of the paper about doing other exercise modalities that would have other benefits. Like if you were doing, you know, swimming, for example, you'd get the cardiovascular stuff. If you're doing gymnastics, you get strength power adaptations along the way. So, yeah. I think some of it too is people don't, they don't quite understand the training process. It was like, it takes a while. So if like I went to a dance class and I try to do something that involves kicking my leg really high, the first time I'm going to be like, Oh my God, I need to go stretch. Like that would be my first inclination. Like I can't do this. I need to go do something different to now be able to do this. Mm-hmm. But when you, you know, you think about it, no, you can just keep doing this, but just go as far as you can. If the body's adaptable to whatever your structure will allow over time, you'll be able to kick higher and higher. It's like, I always give the example of when you warm up, you go into the gym and you've got squats and you do that first air squat and everything hurts. And you're like, Oh Lord, I need to go warm up for my warm up." And then you go off and you do a bunch of non-specific things where if you just stay in there and just kind of keep working into that squat 10 or 15 minutes later, you're actually feeling pretty good. And you, and you kind of stuck with the specificity of the thing. Now, my example with me in dance class would require much more mm. exposure and uh, there's a ceiling there. But I think maybe it's, it's just that wanting it to happen, like realizing your deficit and then, wa- and then thinking that you need to do something extra to get it fast instead of just yeah. a- appreciating that you are here now and that if you just kind of keep exposing yourself to this thing, it will improve over time. Uh, now it's easy. It's easier said than done on the outside, but yeah. Well, that harkens back a little bit to what he said about time. And it's something that, you know, we mentioned in the course quite a bit is it, time matters. It is January 10th right now. That means nine days ago, a ton of people decided that they were going to set some goal that, means something to them and 50% of them have probably already stopped. And their number one reason for new year's resolution is to stop is time. It takes too much time. I'm in the gym too long. This is too much. And if you're inserting things into your training program that take up time that like Quinn said, he doesn't enjoy stretching. Why? Okay. So why put it in there? If it's getting in the way of something that's going to get you a result that has other benefits, then why put it in that that time frame? If we're talking to people of the gen population or or patients or something that are on a time crunch, if they enjoy it, 100%, I understand completely. But if they don't, then why are we going to waste that time? Yep. Hey, Jim, you mentioned that you've um – one of the one of the criticisms of the paper. Now, actually, I remember what we said. I brought something up, and you were like, "That was that's a common criticism that I hear." Oh, it's just a, it was the fact that most of the researchers on the sit and reach. A question I wanted to ask you was, what else since since this paper has been published? What are some of the questions or the the common things that you're fielding that either you addressed in section seven and people didn't read, or that. Maybe or or maybe more things beyond that, you know, common questions or, or rebuttals to the to the paper itself. So I'd say overall the the feedback's been positive. I've gotta say, so I've published um over thirty some peer reviewed papers and I've gotten more sort of personal messages and emails about this paper than all my other papers combined, which sort of demonstrated to me, oh, wow, like this is something people are still very much interested in and still debated. The vast majority of those were positive, but that could be a bit biased because maybe people that have more positive views on something are more likely to reach out to you and tell you rather than tell you how terrible a person you are. Um, but most most of it's been positive. Um yeah, there was, and even even when it's been has a slightly sort of skeptical tone, which is perfectly fine. I don't mind that. Um, even when it does have a skeptical tone, I think people still appreciate uh, maybe the the scope of the review and and most of what it's saying. See, one of the one of the problems is that um, some people have only read the abstract. 
so they don't quite see all the nuances. So the paper is very nuanced and it's also quite broad and sort of philosophical as well. You've got to look at the totality of the picture in the paper to sort of see what I'm getting at. Um, I think I had one person email me uh, saying something like, they had some sort of injury and they found that stretching was very beneficial for them and blah, blah, blah. And then a couple lines later they say, Oh, but I didn't actually read the paper. I only read the abstract. I'm like, mate, come on. Like you coming at me uh, without even reading the whole paper. And then they've then proceeded to provide me links to, I think maybe their personal business or something like that. (laughs) But overall, um, look, I think a lot of people sort of in, maybe in, in your shoes as well. Maybe people who personally maybe weren't good at the sit and reach um, are set, finally like saying, oh, you yeah, know, finally <laughs> it. Um, but it actually it, it is very interesting that, so for example, if you think of the U.S.-based fitness tests in, in schools, you know, there are people who do very well on all the tests except the sit and reach. And to me, that says something. Like, I think I take those tweets pretty seriously. I think that's important. Like, well, you know, they're clearly a very high functioning, as far as physical performance goes, individual, yet they score poorly on this one test. Um, maybe the problem isn't their low flexibility. Maybe the problem is that we've made more out of flexibility than. Um, it really is. And this, by the way, is done, I point this out in the paper, you know, this is done on a large scale when we teach students about, you know, looking at norm charts related to flexibility. And if some sort of, you know, below this level, then, you know, for sure they got to do stretching. It's done in research papers. I cited a couple examples where um, in some older papers, it, it was it's a, just a bit silly. I feel like people are losing perspective. There was one paper that was studying maybe like elite field hockey players versus controls on different fitness measures. And the hockey players had lower flexibility uh, levels. And the authors got a bit concerned about that and were saying, oh, this is sort of evidence that they need to improve their flexibility or something to improve their fitness. And I'm like, what are you talking about? These are elite uh, level players. Like they're some of the most physically fit individuals in the world. So I just think, yeah, there's a bit of loss of perspective. And I hope, yeah, people that are a bit unsure of, you know, if if you sort of look at the title and just the abstract of my paper, you might not realize how sort of nuanced um, everything is. So I'd encourage people to read it all. The other thing I need to just clarify is that I'm very sort of explicit in saying and using the term major component of physical fitness. And that's a really important thing to recognize because um, what I'm referring to there is the ACSM's components of physical fitness. So there's five of them. I don't think we've said this yet, so it's really important. Um, One of them is flexibility. One is muscle strength. One is muscle endurance. Then there's cardiovascular endurance and body composition. So those I've turned the five major components of fitness because ACSM is a very influential um, organization. And the fact that they have sort of marked those as being the five go-to ones, I think that's important. And what I'm demonstrating in the paper is actually when you look at all the other components, the other four, flexibility does not, does not even come close to being as important for health and function than, than those other ones. Um, so yeah, it's important to recognize in the paper, I'm saying major component. It doesn't mean that flexibility isn't important. It could be sort of like a secondary um, component and maybe we need to have bigger picture discussions on physical fitness testing, which ones are the most important and then which ones are maybe the more um, secondary ones, because I can think of, you know, tons of tests that would be better than the sit and reach. <laughs> Anything that involves actually moving your body, uh, first of all, would be a, a good start. And we said probably specific to the task, because those hockey players probably have a surplus in range, of range of motion in, in certain areas and, and deficits in others, as 
to accommodate their sport, like Jared was saying with a, a major league pitcher. Yeah. And to the, to your point about the totality of the evidence, you do present evidence that also, if you read it as a standalone, would be evidence in favor of static stretching. You you are presenting one thing I appreciate about the paper is you're presenting the evidence, and there are there is evidence on a sliding scale, and that's how I kind of conceptualize the totality of the evidence. Where am I nudging? What am I nudging towards? And then you and then it's a cost benefit. It's it's opportunity cost. If I based on the current evidence, is am I getting bang for buck for this thing, or is this thing uh, worth testing? Is it is it giving me information to then guide my treatment? I think that's the that's to me was the message of the paper. Um, well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I I hope that you are able to voice and express the what you wanted people to to get out of reading this because i hope it's it's a compliment to reading the paper and they can actually listen to you ex- explaining the thought process behind it and i think it's going to be really really helpful and get people thinking about stuff coach clinician athlete general public alike where can people see more of your work potentially uh connect with you that type of thing Oh, probably the best avenue right now is through Twitter. So I think my Twitter handle is James L. Nuzzo. So N-U-Z-Z-O. That's probably the best one. Um, if they're interested in reading more of my research, I've got a Google Scholar page and um, can also put my name into PubMed uh, as well. ResearchGate as well? Oh, yeah. Sorry. ResearchGate. Okay. James L. Nuzzo. Yep. We'll link all that stuff in the show notes. And actually, I wanted to ask because I was looking at your research gate, and I have a, actually had pulled up a paper on uh, uh, corticospinal excitability with strength training. I don't want to read that, but in the very beginning of the show, you mentioned that you were doing some stuff with the uh, Journal of Applied Physiology, like a multi-part kind of thing. Is any of that published yet? For te- uh, yeah, so that that was published um, early uh, last year. So okay. Uh, then the name of the paper, I'm going to see if I can. So it starts with the initials C-O-R-P, CORP, because that stands for, I believe, um, something along the lines of Core Issues of Reproducibility and Physiology. And then the subtitle is something along the lines of um, uh, Measurements of Muscle Strength and Voluntary Activation. Cool. Okay. So that's published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. And that's that's a very um, a very large, broad review on muscle strength and voluntary activation, how we measure it, um, what are some of the caveats of measuring those things to make the measurements more um, more reliable. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jim. We really appreciate you coming on the show. We'll link all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, this is this has been great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank I you. Appreciate you coming on, man. That was great. Very much. Thanks. We'd like to thank Jim for being on the show. You can check out the show notes for links to all of Jim's work and the paper that we discussed on this show. And of course, thank you to my homies, Jared Maynard and John Flagg for steering this ship alongside me. And thank you, the clinical athlete community, all six of you, for joining us on this journey of knowledge and improved practice in both the gym and clinic. If you want to dive even deeper into the clinical athlete community, you can check out all that the Clinical Athlete Forum has to offer, which includes our Clinical Athlete Academy courses, amazing discussions, and networking with professional clinicians, coaches, as well as students, and just our overall hub of knowledge in regards to athlete health and performance. Thanks, everyone, and talk to you soon.